Welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast, where we talk to C-level leaders from across the payments landscape. We'll be discussing the products and services that impact the payment space today, as well as trends and predictions for the future of payments. We will also hear stories from our guests about their journeys to the top. Great question. And I think this is where everyone kind of gets to where are you different, right? And I've touched on it a little bit, talked about integration and partners and white glove approach with our private business. But in my mind, it's that we operate a global business under the preview of being a financial institution in a number of jurisdictions. And with that provides a regulatory compliant financial framework that is second to none within the space that we play in worldwide and against our competitors. That was Bob Dowd, CEO North America for Money Corp. And he is our special guest this week on episode 129 of the Leaders in Payments podcast. And I'm your host, Greg Myers. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with Bob, a man who started his 38-year payments career at Kennedy Airport in New York, carrying hundreds of thousands of dollars across terminals in a canvas bag. So how did he go from this to CEO of the only non-U.S. bank in the world to have a direct relationship with the U.S. Federal Reserve? Well, the harder you work, the luckier you get is one of his favorite adages, if that tells you anything. Money Corp is an international payments and foreign exchange company that leads the industry in providing global payments and currency risk management to corporations and partners around the world. They have $50 billion in foreign exchange flows and $200 million in top-line revenue and facilitate $6 million individual payments on an annual basis. Bob talks about where the industry is headed as it relates to real-time, low-value payment rails and blockchain, and how his company kept global economies afloat by delivering cash throughout the world during the COVID pandemic. We've got a great episode ahead, so let's get started. Hi, Bob. Thank you for being here, and welcome to the Leaders in Payments podcast. Thank you, Greg. It's my pleasure and delight to be joining you today. Well, let's dive in. And if you don't mind, tell the audience a little bit about yourself, maybe where you grew up, where you went to school, where you currently live, a few things like that about maybe you personally, and then we'll dive into your career and your position later in the discussion. Great. So grew up on Long Island, New York, where I spent majority of my life up until the age of 24, went to school at Lebanon Valley College, which is a small liberal arts school so I could play Division Three sports, which is near Hershey, Pennsylvania. Started in accounting as a major and realized that wasn't really kind of my gig and got into business. And from there, met my wife in college. We got married in 86. We have two wonderful children where I'm now the grandfather of another two, which is the joy of my wife and my life outside of work. We live in Annapolis, Maryland now, where we enjoy life on the Chesapeake Bay. And, you know, some of the hobbies that we do, we do sailing and boating, and we both like to golf. And we are enjoying our empty nest years together very much. And she's able to travel now with me on work. And so that's a little bit about me. Awesome. What college sports did you play? I played tennis and golf my freshman year. I played fall golf and spring tennis, and I played four years of tennis in high school where I played very competitive. And then in my fraternity, a number of members played lacrosse, and I said, I can play golf and tennis the rest of my life. And I spent the final three years in college playing lacrosse. Nice, nice. Well, let's talk about the company a little bit. Let's discuss Money Corp. So tell us what Money Corp does. So Money Corp is a international payments and foreign exchange company. And that sounds pretty broad, but we're a leading provider of global payments and currency risk management to corporations and partners around the world. We were started in 1979, really focused on retail and private international payments. And when I say private, I'm talking about high net worth individuals predominantly buying property abroad with a focus really in the UK up until about 10 years ago where we went internationally. And today we really focus our international payments on both corporates 
where we help them make payments in foreign currency and in U.S. dollars all around the world. And whether that's through our online platform or an integrated solution or through APIs and private wealth individuals, again, who are buying property yachts abroad, where we have very much a white glove approach within that product line. And then our other business line, now that we are out of the retail business, for the most part as an organization, we have a FIG business, which is our financial institutional group. We are the only entity outside of the U.S., only bank entity. So there's actually two bank entities within the Money Corp group, and I can talk about that a little bit later. But within our FIG group, we have a U.S. dollar bank account at the U.S. Federal Reserve in New York, where we supply cash. U.S. dollars to central banks around the world. And so therefore, we have relationships with banks in Africa, Asia, LATAM, the Middle East, all around the world where we supply them with the physical U.S. dollar cash through the Federal Reserve relationship that we have. Okay. And are there specific verticals that you focus on? Yeah. So obviously within the FIG group, that's a financial institutional vertical where we offer both a banknote product and a payment services product for within the payment product, you're talking about tier two and tier three banks that we typically will service or the tier one banks we're predominantly servicing our banknote business. Within our corporate payments business, we focus on travel. We focus on assets-based lending where we help then mitigate their foreign exchange risk with providing hedging options, whether those are structured products or typical forward products. You have relocation companies that are making payments all around the world. The gig economy, where they're making payroll all around the world for gig workers that you name it, they're doing it. We have our maritime vertical where we're helping the maritime industry either make payments on their behalf, or we're helping their crew members receive their payroll on a weekly basis. So there's a number of verticals that we work in, and that's just a handful of a number that we actually focus our energy on. Okay. And you mentioned the word partnerships. Can you sort of explain, are these sales channel partnerships or integration partnerships? Can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. Actually, it's a combination of both, Greg. If you look at our sales channel, so we have a number of partners that actually have platforms in the gig economy that they help organizations that support the gig economy that they need to make payments into. So that could be a vendor portal that they actually provide their beneficiary information. And then as they need to make payments, they then facilitate those payments through us. So that's definitely a partner type of sales channel, but we also have integrated partners through technology. So that could be someone like Cloud Elements that we have a partnership with where we integrate into 12 different accounting packages. So whether you're with NetSuites or Xero, just to name a couple of accounting systems, we can integrate directly into those accounting packages through our relationship with Cloud Elements. We also have a partnership with a company called Kick Global. And within that partnership, you name the type of payment method, we can do it. Well, what does that mean? Well, we're an international payments company, so we do the international piece. But if you need to make a payment to a gig worker on Venmo, PayPal, direct to debit, to an ATM, we actually have relationships where any type of payment that you want to do domestically or globally, we can facilitate through that integrated partnership. So there are a number of ways, whether that's through APIs or direct integration into our online platform that we utilize our partnerships. Another area that I mentioned is our private high net worth individuals. So we have thousands of partnerships with title companies, realtors, closing agents, mortgage companies, where we help foreign buyers of whether that's buying property in the U.S. or U.S. citizens buying property in Portugal, Spain, Italy. Those are all referring agents and partnerships that refer these type of businesses to us through our partnership network. So partnerships is a very critical component of what we do and our success as a business. Okay. And how big is the company? So Money Corp has 592 employees worldwide. We operate in North America, South America, Asia, Europe, and Australia. We have sales of over $50 billion 
in foreign exchange flows that we do on an annual basis. We facilitate 6 million payments annually, and our top line revenues are at $200 million approximately that we deliver on an annual basis. Okay. In order to transact in some of these countries, do you have to have a physical location there? Yeah. So everywhere that we do business, we're licensed. So in the United States, we're licensed in 48 states that require licenses for both corporate and private individuals for us to service. And those usually are under money transmitter licenses. Why we don't have 50 is that there's actually two states in the United States that don't require licenses in order to do that. So we have separate entities in the UK that is fully licensed. And then we're fully licensed post-Brexit in the European Union as well. So each of those jurisdictions that we actually have offices and where we can service customers, we are fully licensed. And as I mentioned previously, we actually operate in two jurisdictions as a financial institution. So we are Money Corp Bank operates in Gibraltar, and then Money Corp Banco de Cambio operates as a foreign exchange bank in Brazil where we are fully licensed through the regulators there as well. Okay. And what would you say differentiates your company from your competitors out there? So great question. And I think this is where everyone kind of gets to where are you different, right? And I've touched on it a little bit and talked about integration and partners and white glove approach with our private business. But in my mind, it's that we operate a global business under preview of being a financial institution in a number of jurisdictions. And with that provides a regulatory compliant financial framework that is second to none within the space that we play in worldwide and against our competitors. Being the only non-U.S. bank that has a relationship with the U.S. Federal Reserve speaks volumes of our differentiation. Nobody else has that. Now, that was a seven-year process that we went through in order to get that. And that relationship has just blossomed over the last three years, much so where we literally help keep economies afloat by ensuring that we could deliver U.S. dollar cash during COVID. And people would think, well, what is that? Well, the two main providers of U.S. dollars around the world were other institutions who basically shut down during COVID, and they couldn't figure out how to get money out of the United States into third world countries in order to support them and their needs with U.S. dollar cash. We were able to figure out how to be a logistics company at the same time of being an international payments and foreign currency company. And we helped deliver cash throughout the world during a time that was greatly needed that literally helped keep economies afloat. So that differentiation alone of having the relationships both with the Federal Reserve, being a bank, and providing a suite of products that provide a differentiation and help mitigate foreign exchange risk for our companies is truly where we see ourselves as being different. Okay. And where do you see this industry heading? And and you can sort of answer that from a couple of different dimensions, whether that's B2B payments in general or cross-border payments or whichever you choose or both. But where do you see all this headed in, say, the next two to three years? So the industry is definitely changing direction in terms of how it makes payments over the last couple of years. Well, forever, You utilize SWIFT as a payment method to facilitate payments between banks on debits and credits, typically taking two days where correspondent banks were involved and beneficiary banks were involved. And each bank that touched that payment typically would take a fee in some way, shape, or form. What has now been developed are low-value payment rails. So the equivalent of an ACH payment in the United States or a SEPA payment in Europe where you're using low-value payment rails where they're cost-effective. There's no additional fees being taken out of that payment, and the beneficiary bank is not charging a fee to receive that payment. So if you send 10,000 euros, you get 10,000 euros. You now have over 45 different currencies that you can do low-value payment rails in. In addition to the low-value payment rails that have become very cost-effective for say, gig workers that are receiving payments, so they ensure that they get full value, you now have the ability to get payments in real time in a number of jurisdictions. 
So that's me facilitating a payment to the Philippines today and them going in and seeing that in their account in 15 minutes. That is how the payments industry is changing over the next two or three years, where more and more low-value instant payment rails are being created to speed up the process and reduce the costs of making payments. Now, where we're going to go in the next 10 years, right, and could be as quick as the next three, four, five, is blockchain, right? And blockchain changes the game in that, you know, you're using ledger technology in order to facilitate a payment and everything's done in real time. So that's me facilitating a payment now. And Greg, you seeing it in India instantaneously and you seeing it on your account instantaneously. And where we're all trying to figure out is what is the closed user group that can be created in order to facilitate a blockchain payment in real time? And that's where the industry needs to wrap its head around in order to get it. So I could be a car dealership and deal with all these card manufacturers in Canada, say. I can create a closed user group and I can create blockchain technology and do instantaneous payments in real time and everyone gets it. But that's a closed user group. How do you bring that out to the masses? Right? How do you then bring that out to individuals? And I think that's where we're going to go over the next five to 10 years is that type of technology being more prevalent than it is today. Because today, it's still kind of just talked about, but not really utilized, right? And that's where I see the wave of the future when it comes to international payments and cross-border payments, is that everything's going to be in a real-time method in a very cost-effective way. Do you think that will require all these different jurisdictions to have sort of the same regulatory and compliance standards? They're going to have to be some type of standardization in order for everyone to get comfortable in order to be utilizing it around the world. So probably the G10 countries can come to an agreement into how does that operate? Well, that thing covering trade off in, say, 70 percent of the world right? Or within your trading partners. But how do you then bring that into South America, Asia, Africa, when you're making payments around? And they could be laggers on this, but I think they would then follow what the industrial countries might be putting in place and then being able to piggyback on that and utilizing that in the future. They might not be building it themselves, but they're going to look to see what others are doing in order to then take advantage of that down the road. Sure, sure. So one other question about Money Corp that came to mind when you were talking is, what is the typical size of the company that you work with? Are they typically larger companies who are doing tons of international transactions or could it be small companies that are only doing a few? It actually varies quite a bit, Greg. So we certainly have a large SME, small, medium enterprise base because they typically are underserved by their banks. They don't get the same attention as a Fortune 500 or a large corporate would from their financial institution. And that could be from a pricing perspective. That could be from a market intelligence perspective. That could be from a fee perspective. Right? And we certainly, that's our sweet spot. We do a really good job there of the underserviced corporate customers. I mean, we have over 10,000 corporate customers within our portfolio worldwide. But we also have the large enterprise, and the large enterprise is more of the customers that are integrated, where we're using APIs, we're using low-value payment rails, where we can go into a large organization that's sending a 1,000 euro payments on a monthly basis, and their bank is facilitating every single one of those euros as a SWIFT payment. And they're charging them $10 to do it. And there's a correspondent bank fee, and there's a beneficiary bank fee. And we've gone in and gone, Ah, industry best practice would be, hey, these can go as SEPA payments, which is the equivalent of an ACH payment in the U.S., in euros, and I can charge you a dollar to that, right? There's no corresponding bank fees. There's no lifting fees. And so we're going in to share best practice in a consultative approach and showing them what good looks like. Now, a financial institution typically doesn't do that because, wait a second, I'm going to go in and show them how to do it cheaper, which means I'm making less money. Instead of me charging $10, I got to charge a dollar. So it's not in the financial institution's best interest to be going into some of these large corporates and showing them what good looks like or sharing industry best practice. So when we have those opportunities, 
in many cases to go into larger companies. You know, we're not trying to do all their foreign exchange. We're not trying to do all their hedging. Right. We understand that they have very important relationships with their financial institutions. But in many, many cases, we show them that there's something that they're doing today that just can be done much better, much cost effective, and certainly eliminate manual processes that might be in place. So, again, whether that's using file upload or APIs or integrating into their accounting or treasury workstations, those tend to be our larger customers that we're doing those type of product lines with. Okay, great. That makes perfect sense. Well, let's switch gears a little bit and talk about you. So you mentioned you went off to college, started in accounting, decided to move into business. So coming out of college, what was your career journey to where you are today as the CEO there? Wow. So I like to tell my employees this story because I tell them you can start on the ground level and work your way up to CEO if you work hard. And I literally started at the ground level. So I started as a foreign exchange teller at Kennedy Airport in New York selling foreign currency to travelers from 2 in the afternoon to 8 o'clock at night. And I learned every currency known to man at the time. There was no euro. So you had your Italian lira, you had your French franc, you had your Greek drachma, you had your German mark. And I started with a company called Deke Pereira. So Deke Pereira was known as the foreign exchange experts at the time. They were around since 1928. We had 13 locations at Kennedy Airport in New York. And I literally carried hundreds of thousands of dollars between terminals in a bag (laughs) back in the day. And then I remember when we did, when I became supervisor of the main office, that was, I got to work seven in the morning to three in the afternoon. And we would do the Swiss cargo shipments that would come in with millions of dollars. And we would count, you know, millions of dollars worth of cash and then distribute it through our offices throughout the U.S. And I started in 1984. And in 1990, we were acquired by Thomas Cook. So Thomas Cook, which is a top brand out of the UK, which was known for travel at the time, had a financial services group that also sold traveler's checks, the Thomas Cook original traveler's check. So it was a nice fit for them. And we started dabbling in this corporate foreign exchange space, so very much a retail network. And I got into the corporate foreign exchange space where they go, oh, why don't you go do some sales? I'm like, sales? I don't want to do sales. I didn't come to do sales. And I turned out to be pretty good at sales, but I always wanted to get back in. And I got back in and I became a trader. And then we created this big old corporate FX business in the back of our retail network. And that grew exponentially. And I managed all of sales and dealing for the East Coast. Then we were acquired by TravelX in 2000. At TravelX, I was on the executive board where I headed up all of sales for North America. And then ultimately, I ran all of our vertical markets within North America and all of our partnerships. So vertical markets, as you mentioned before, and partnerships are very near and dear to me and my background. I helped create our financial institutional space, which I think today makes about $75 million for that organization, just in the North American business alone. And then I left after 25 years, right before they sold the business to Western Union. And I joined this small little company at the time called Cambridge Global Payments. And in six years, I helped take that business from $20 million in revenue to, well, $20 million in top line revenue to $160 million in revenue, where they then sold that to Fleet Corp. And I joined Money Corp as CEO of the North American business after being headhunted by them two and a half years ago. And this journey has been fantastic because I've been able to take what I've done previously in my career, apply it here at Money Corp, where we bought a business in 2018. And I mean, this year we're growing at 45% of where we were last year. And I've been able to add people that I've worked with previously and literally I've always said I'm only as good as the people that are working for me. I have people that work in every single department, and those heads of those departments are good at what they do. They know what good looks like, and we have implemented certainly a best practice approach here at Money Corp. And it certainly has been my pleasure to help 
drive this organization over the last two and a half years. So you've been in this space a few years, you're saying? I have been in this space for a few years. (laughs) Yeah. That's great. That's great. I can just see you in a booth. Didn't they have like the booths with the ticker at the top at the airport? Yeah, yeah. My wife has a picture of me (laughs) in a mobile golf cart in the old Pan Am terminal in 1985 with, I think I had permed hair and a cheesy mustache, (laughs) right? And she likes to say, this is how your father started his career. (laughs) That's great. (laughs) That's great. Well, what are some things that you're passionate about? So maybe pick one work-related thing and one personal thing. Great question. Passion is about the desire to be good at what you do. You know, you have a job and I'm an individual, like whatever I'm going to do, I'm going to do it to the best of my ability. And it's the old adage, the harder you work, the luckier you get. Mm -hmm. And I think I've had that success in my career where I raised my hand to volunteer. I said, yeah, I'll hop on that jet and go down to DC and help them because they're short staffed or whatever it would take in order to be successful at what we were trying to do. So I think passion is a bit of a mindset in being determined to be good at what you do, but not at all costs, right? It's still a right way to do things. And in my career, I've learned from a number of individuals the right way to do things. And I've also learned from individuals the wrong way to do things. And I think just being passionate about who you work for, what you do, and your business is is extremely important. And it's sort of like, well, why do it if you're not passionate about it, right? And then from a personal perspective, yeah, I mean, there's two things. To me, it's family. Right. You know, as you get older, you realize how important family is to everything that you do. And in many cases, you're trying to make a better life for the next generation and then the next generation after that. And your parents certainly did that for me. And my grandparents certainly did that for them. So certainly family in my mind is something that I and then becoming a grandparent over the last two years. I mean, anyone who's a grandparent and says, what is it like to be a grandparent? And they say it's wonderful. You don't really know it until you're actually a grandparent because then you know it. (laughs) It's just a different journey and it's just a different experience and it's great. So I'd say my second most passionate thing. Now, my wife would say golf is my second most passionate (laughs) thing, but in all honesty, it's definitely family. Awesome. Well, when I started in payments back in 2004 or five, you know, payments and fintech and, you know, all this fancy stuff that we have now and all this money that's being invested just really didn't exist back then. I don't even think the word fintech existed, but now it's sort of a sexy industry to be in. So what advice would you give someone maybe coming right out of college, they're looking at payments or fintech as a career path? What would you tell them they need to do to be successful? Learn the industry. Because the industry is vast. Payments is a huge, I mean, my background is international payments, right? And FX and balance sheet exposure and hedging foreign exchange risk. That's like a minute portion of what the payments world is. Because payments could be credit cards. It could be merchant acquirers. It could be domestic. It could be low value rails. It could be Venmo and PayPal and, you know, fintechs that are coming out with technology and vendor portals and customer journey experiences. So it doesn't have to be kind of a sales oriented thing. It doesn't have to be an operational oriented thing. It could be a tech thing. I mean, there's just so many aspects of the payments business that just at Money 2020, right? And mm-hmm. which is the big payments conference in Vegas that's held every year. And every year I go, who is that? It's like, <laughs> what company is that? What do they do? It's like, I've not heard of, I, like I've been in this for, you know, 38 years. I've not heard of them before. And you go and you listen to them and they could be a startup, right? And you go, wow, that's really good, right? So my advice is, all the good ideas have not been taken up yet. I right. can tell you that. Right. And this is an ever evolving industry that is changing each and every year quickly, right? This is a quickly moving industry that's evolving, changing, and the dynamics, and it's a real interesting space to be in. 
All right. I think that's great advice. I think a lot of people could definitely learn something from just, you know, something as simple as understanding the industry and the industry is so vast. So what part of the industry are you going to learn? And I think that's some great advice. And you weren't learn one part of the industry. There's another part of the industry. So the more you learn in the different sections you learn, it makes you more attractive in the marketplace as well. Sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Bob, we've covered a lot of ground about you personally, your career, and obviously the company and the industry. Is there anything else you'd like to add before we wrap up? No, I'd just like to thank you again, Greg, for the opportunity to share my story, share the story of Money Corp. Our journey is not done. And certainly anyone interested in Money Corp and what we do and how we can do it can certainly reach out to us at moneycorp.com. Okay. Well, Bob, thank you so much for being on the show today. I know your time is very valuable, so I really appreciate you being here. Thank you, Greg. And to all you listeners out there, I thank you for your time as well. And until the next story. Thank you for joining us this week on the Leaders in Payments podcast. Make sure you visit our website at leadersinpayments.com, where you can subscribe to the show and where you'll find our show notes. If you enjoyed listening, please share on your social channels as well. 